Okay, so folks, thank you uh, for coming to the second of the Han series lectures, and uh, I'm going to share a little bit because these things go up on YouTube, and you'd be surprised how many people watch them. I'm going to share a little bit about Lewis Hahn and the Hahn lecture that I did not share in the first uh, introduction when we were so fortunate to have Zach Thomas Longcool speak. I first met Lewis Hahn, I think, in 1989 at the Southwestern Philosophical Society, which he had been president of in about 1956. <laughs> Lewis Hahn was born in 1908, and he passed away in 2004. And you do the math, that's 96 years. Uh, from about 1989 until his passing, uh, I knew him well. Uh, he was somebody that I encountered at every philosophy meeting because he went to every philosophy meeting, as far as I can tell. Because everyone I showed up at, Lewis was there. And I would always sit down with Lewis and ask about the Library of Living Philosophers, which he had been editor of since 1981. I only got into philosophy in 1984, so he was already, to my mind, the editor of the Library of Living Philosophers. And what I remember most about Lewis was the way that he would raise a hand I should almost put on I should almost put on the accent, shouldn't I? Lewis was from Lois was from West Texas. And he spoke slowly. <laughs> and he would do this and you needed to Wait, because when he finally said what he was thinking, it was worth waiting for. <laughs> you remember Pete, don't you? <laughs> anyway, uh, Lewis uh, was a singular individual, a true gentleman, somebody who represented the best of what the philosophy discipline could really offer to the world. A contextualist, an interculturalist, somebody who opened up the East-West uh, philosophy dialogue. He was one of the co-founders of Philosophy East-West, the, the journal. He made many, many trips to the Far East, and he uh, very much founded the discussion that goes on today uh, in comparative philosophy. We named this series of lectures after him, not because we just happened to know him, but because his contribution to philosophy was enormous. It's not just the 15 volumes of the Library of Living Philosophers that he edited, it had to do with the way that he was an ambassador for the philosophy profession. Would that we had more people like Lewis Hahn. All right, that said, it's time for the second of our Lewis Hahn lectures. Mike Schleter got his PhD from Penn State. That's when I met him. I met him in the basement of Doug Anderson's house when he was invited to a jam session where it turns out that he was to be the center of attention. Because Mike Schleter can, in addition to philosophizing, can really play the guitar and sing. Now it's difficult to know what it is that leads somebody who was clearly called to be a musician in life 
into philosophy, but I have to, I have to think that it has to do with economics. <laughs> and unsurprisingly, Mike Sleater ended up spending a lot of time thinking about just that subject. He's an associate professor of philosophy at Pacific Lutheran University, a very fine institution in Tacoma, Washington. And it is my pleasure to invite him to give the second of our Han Lecture series right now. Please make him feel welcome. All right, thank you, Randy. Uh, the piece that I'm going to read for you today is called uh, On the Goods, and the S is in parentheses, of Economics, Reflections on the Social Economics of Kenneth Stickers. Uh, I want to begin by thanking the organizers of the Lewis Hahn Memorial Lecture, as well as the Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity and the American Institute for Philosophical and Cultural Thought for inviting me here this weekend to reflect with you on the work of our main speaker, Ken Stickers. I truly feel honored to have been asked, uh, and I'm very much looking forward to the conversations we'll be having together in the coming hours and days. Uh, by way of introduction, I first met Ken back in 2012, after having been invited to give a relatively informal talk on Adam Smith's political economy uh, at SIU Carbondale. After the talk, some of the attendees and I made our way to a local bar to unwind. <laughs> And while sitting on the patio amidst perspiring pint glasses, Ken struck up a conversation with me. As the conversation progressed, we discovered that the paths we had traversed, both intellectually and strangely geographically, had intersected in some interesting ways. Ken began his collegiate studies outside of the humanities in the social sciences. I began mine in the natural sciences, and we both eventually found our way to philosophy. Ken's graduate work focused on pragmatism and phenomenology, and he's since turned his attention to the philosophy of economics. My graduate work focused on phenomenology, and I've since turned my attention to the philosophy of economics, and more recently, to pragmatism. Ken's career as a student and teacher brought him to Illinois, Minnesota, and Washington State. So is mine, though not in quite the same order. <laughs> Indeed, he was an undergraduate and graduate student at DePaul University, where I taught for three years while finishing my dissertation. And he earned his first master's degree at the University of Minnesota, where I was an undergraduate student. Ken's first tenured teaching position was at Seattle University, and mine was, and still is, at Pacific Lutheran University, only 40 or so miles away. I wonder, Ken, what to make of these somewhat jumbled coincidences. Does anything else in your past or present point the way to my future? <laughs> Will I someday find myself a visiting professor in Mexico, Poland, Ireland, or Italy, as you found yourself in all four of these places? I suppose only time will tell. In any event, I want to spend the next 30 minutes or so with you reflecting specifically on Ken's social economics, which, as he explains in one of his earliest published articles in this area, quote, distinguishes itself from other approaches to the study of economy, primarily in the following two ways. One, it views economy as one aspect of, and inseparable from, an organic social whole, rather than as one unit of society, in large part detachable from that whole. And two, social economics views normative issues is as at least equally important for economics as empirical ones. Economics is as much a branch of ethics as it is a social science. In this way, social economists locate themselves within the tradition of economic thought that, within the Western context at any rate, stretches back to Xenophon, Plato, and Aristotle, proceeds through St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Thomas More, and continues through Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, and Karl Marx, just to name a few key figures. These worldly philosophers, as Robert Heilbronner memorably termed them, did not even attempt, as many contemporary economists do, to separate questions of how goods and services are produced, exchanged, and distributed from questions of how systems of production, exchange, and consumption relates and ought to relate to other systems within a given society, or from questions of how such systems relate and ought to relate to one or another conception of the good, to one or another conception of what is best for human beings to be and to do. By this definition, I suppose I can say, as Ken did at the outset of a recent lecture series, that I am a social economist. Didn't know that. Or at least I can say that I aspire to be. 
which is why I want to focus specifically on the work he's done in this particular capacity. My reflections today will take as their guiding question one that Ken poses in the title of a more recent article, What's an Economy Good For? This question, in all of its deceptive simplicity, lies, I think, at the very heart of social economics, and so at the very heart of both Ken's and my work in this area. But our approaches to answering it have differed in certain respects, and my reflections today will center around an attempt to think through some of the specific respects in which they've differed. More precisely, they'll center around an attempt, first, to sketch out my own approach, apologies, Second, to show how it would seem limited in ways that Ken's is not. And third, to highlight some of the most fascinating aspects of Ken's approach, or at least some of the ones that are most fascinating to my eyes. But before getting started, I want to make explicit two claims that I think constitute part of the backdrop against which the question, what's an economy good for, is posed within the context of social economics. The first claim is that all systems of production, exchange, and consumption, or at least all that have ever gained any real practical or theoretical traction, are in the service of one or another conception of the good, of one or another conception of what is best for human beings to be and to do. As Ken himself has pointed out, all such systems are, quote, based upon ethical assumptions, assumptions about what constitutes the good life. Economic well-being cannot be divorced from human well-being, and hence, any discussion regarding the state, health, or measure of economy cannot be addressed meaningfully without assuming some measure of human well-being, without addressing the ethical questions of what constitutes human flourishing, and what is the relationship of material wealth to such flourishing. Now, the claim that all systems of production, exchange, and consumption are in the service of one or another conception of the good is bound to be met with skepticism by, for example, many contemporary economists, insofar as they, in Ken's words, see economics as neutral and value-free, and see themselves, quote, only as gatherers of empirical facts about economic behaviors and as describers of the laws of such behaviors and of the principles for efficient production and distribution of goods. But it's difficult for me to see how the claim could fail to be true. For all economic systems are characterized by institutions of one sort or another that function to direct human beings in specific ways, to encourage some ways of their being and doing, and to discourage others. And it's not at all clear to me how any such system could long endure, whether in practice or in theory, if it did not, for at least some of those affected by it, promote their good, at least as they conceive it, however imperfectly it may be articulated. Indeed, this would seem to hold for even the most oppressive economic systems. And in fact, the claim would seem to apply to all systems characterized by institutions that function as described. Now, if this is right, then the question is not whether economic systems are in the service of one or another conception of the good, but which conception are they in the service of? The question of who among those affected by these systems actually enjoys a given good, as well as the question of whether it's ultimately worth defending, are separate ones, but for social economists, they are natural sequels. So that was the first claim. The second claim is that all conceptions of the good that systems of production, exchange, and consumption are in the service of, or again, all that have ever gained any real practical or theoretical traction, carry along with them various ontological propositions about both human beings and the world. For to say that such and such is best for human beings to be and to do is, at a minimum, to say not only that such and such is among our and the world's possibilities, but also that it's in some way central among these possibilities and that actualizing it is the most proper mode of our being and doing in the world. But these are propositions about what human beings and the world are. At a minimum, beings with possibilities, some more central than others, that may become actualities. As such, they are propositions that are ontological in character. Now, many social economists have gone well beyond this minimum to advance additional ontological propositions about the beings with these possibilities, about human beings in the world, some in essentializing ways and some not. Aristotle, for example, who argued that economic systems ought to be in the service of arete, went well beyond it, advancing not only the proposition that virtue or excellence was central among our and the world's possibilities, and that actualizing it was the most proper mode of our being and doing in the world, but also additional propositions about the teleological nature of both the human psyche and the cosmos, which served to provide the first proposition with a deeper metaphysical grounding. 
Of course, different conceptions of the good will carry along with them different ontological propositions, but it's difficult for me to see how any could carry none at all. Indeed, even if the Humean dictum that ought claims cannot be derived from is claims is true, it would seem that the reverse is not. For it would seem that at least some is claims can be derived from every ought claim, even if the is claims are not essentializing in nature. And as before, this would seem to hold whether the systems uh, that are in the service of these conceptions are economic or otherwise. If this is right, then the question is not whether the conceptions of the good that economic systems are in the service of carry along with them various ontological propositions about both human beings and the world, but rather which propositions do they carry. And for social economists, this question is of no small significance. For to the extent that the systems that are in the service of these conceptions are characterized by institutions that direct human beings accordingly, these conceptions and the ontological propositions they carry along with them are not merely theoretically descriptive, but practically formative of what human beings and the world are. Again, I think that these two claims constitute part of the backdrop against which the guiding question for my reflections today is posed within the context of social economics. And now that they've been made explicit, we can begin to take up the question itself and ask, what is an economy good for? That is, which conception of the good are economic systems in the service of, both in theory and in practice? As I indicated earlier, my reflections today will center around an attempt first to sketch out my own approach to answering the question, with an eye toward then showing how it would seem to be limited in ways that Ken's is not, and finally highlighting some of the most fascinating aspects of Ken's approach. So that's our roadmap. All right, first section. This goes on for a little too long, but uh, it sets up everything that follows. Uh, it's called Adam Smith and the Liberal Good. My own work in the area of social economics is focused primarily on market economies. And so the question that's lain at its very heart is, which conception of the good are market systems in the service of, both in theory and in practice? And my approach to answering it has relied heavily upon the thoughts of the first great theorist of market economies, Adam Smith. Smith was most certainly a social economist by Ken's definition. Concerned as he was both with questions of how economic systems relate and ought to relate to other systems within a given society, and with questions of how such systems relate and ought to relate to one or another conception of the good. Indeed, in his 1776 opus, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, a text which, by the way, Ken says probably ought to be read as a text in economic justice. That's how I read it. But in any case, uh, in this text, uh, he argued that market systems ought to relate to a broader political system, which he called a system of perfect liberty, as part relates to whole. This broader system, he explained, would be characterized by institutions that would generally function to allow, quote, every man to pursue his own interest his own way. And they would do so primarily by establishing and maintaining a framework of basic rights and freedoms, including the right to own and the freedom to exchange private property. For Smith, then, the conception of the good that both economic and political systems ought primarily to be in the service of was liberty, or perhaps more precisely, the autonomy that liberal institutions would generally function to encourage, or at least not discourage. And this conception carried along with it the ontological proposition that autonomy is central among our and the world's possibilities and that actualizing it is the most proper mode of our being and doing in the world. But Smith went further, advancing an additional proposition about what human beings are, or more specifically, about what our basic motivations are, as we go about the business of pursuing our own interests, our own ways. For Smith claimed that we are all possessed of what he called the desire of bettering our condition, a desire which, though generally calm and dispassionate, comes with us from the womb and never leaves us till we go into the grave. And he continued, in the whole interval which separates these two moments, there is scarce perhaps a single instant in which any man is so perfectly and completely satisfied with his situation as to be without any wish of alteration or improvement of any kind. An augmentation of fortune is the means by which the greater part of men propose and wish to better their condition. Smith thus claimed that we are all in a nearly constant state of more or less profound dissatisfaction with our situation and so are all possessed of the desire to mitigate this dissatisfaction, specifically by augmenting our fortunes, that is, by increasing our material wealth. And this additional proposition about what our basic motivations are, as we go about the business of pursuing our own interests our own ways, was in fact at the very center of his social economic thought. For Smith, this desire, the desire of bettering our condition, held the potential for both great social benefit and great social harm, depending upon whether it worked within or turned against the system of perfect liberty and its institutions. 
Within the context of market systems, these institutions would generally function to ensure that exchanges of goods and services were, in fact, free, that they were carried out without force, constraint, or fraud. Now, Smith allowed for some exceptions here, arguing that, except that exchanges could sometimes be forced or constrained by governments if doing so were either in the service of liberty itself or in the service of some other vital public good that could not otherwise be obtained. For example, governments could force their citizens to pay taxes in support of a military force, as well as in support of what Smith called an exact administration of justice, both of which he thought were necessary for the preservation of liberty itself. Furthermore, they could force their citizens to pay taxes in support of, quote, certain public works and certain public institutions, such as roads and schools, which he said, it can never be for the interest of any individual or small number of individuals to erect and maintain, because the profit could never repay the expense to any individual or small number of individuals, though it may frequently do much more than repay it to a great society. But these were, again, exceptions, and for Smith, relatively rare ones within the framework of basic rights and freedoms established and maintained by the institutions of market systems. Smith argued that so long as the desire of bettering our condition worked within the framework of basic rights and freedoms, it could serve as an engine for both prosperity and, in fact, a certain species of equality. For he argued that it would lead us first to make efforts to increase our productivity, both by entering into the division of labor and by introducing new technologies into the processes of production. And second, to enter only into those exchanges of goods and services that were to our advantage. It's in, this connection with the uh, it's in connection with the latter that the most famous passage in the Wealth of Nations finds its real significance. It's the passage that everybody, if they know any passage, knows. Uh, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from regard to their own interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love, and never talk to them of our own necessities, but of their advantages. In this way, Smith argued that the desire of bettering our condition would give rise not only to an increase in the amount of goods and services produced, but also to an increase in the extent to which they were shared within a society. As he explained, in a well-governed society, quote, every workman has a great quantity of his own work to dispose of, beyond what he himself has occasion for, and every other workman being exactly in the same situation, he is enabled to exchange a great quantity of his own goods for a great quantity of theirs. He supplies them abundantly with what they have occasion for, and they accommodate him as amply with what he has occasion for, and a general plenty diffuses itself through all the different ranks of society. He also recalls it a, a universal opulence. But Smith went further than this and argued that the desire of bettering our condition would also give rise to an increase in equality. Not in the sense that all would enjoy the same level of income or wealth, but rather in the sense that all would enjoy the same overall balance of advantages and disadvantages in their different employments of both their labor and their capital stock. Quote here, yeah. As he explained, this overall balance, he says, must in the same neighborhood be either uh, perfectly equal or continuing uh, toward equality. If in the same neighborhood there was any employment evidently either more or less advantageous than the rest, so many people would crowd into it in the one case, and so many would desert it in the other, that its advantages would soon return to the level of other employments. This at least would be the case in a society where things were left to follow their natural course, where there was perfect liberty, and where every man was perfectly free, both to choose what occupation he thought proper and to change it as often as he thought proper. Every man's interest would prompt him to seek the advantageous and to shun the disadvantageous employment. Thus, for Smith, the desire of bettering our condition held the potential for great social benefit, in that so long as it worked within the market systems and their institutions, uh, it could give rise to both prosperity and a certain species of equality. Indeed, for Smith, the society did not, did not need to choose between liberty on the one hand and prosperity and equality on the other, for the one would naturally give rise to the others. One more paragraph on Smith. But Smith also recognized that the, that the desire of bettering our condition could turn against the framework of basic rights and freedoms established and maintained by the institutions of market systems, and so it could pose a threat, not only to liberty, but also to the prosperity and equality to which liberty could naturally give rise. For he observed it, would lead us not only, it could lead us not only to turn against the framework directly, and this is gonna be an important distinction later, it could lead us not only to turn against the framework directly, to violate the basic rights and freedoms of others by subjecting them to illicit force, constraint, or fraud in their exchanges, but also to turn against it indirectly, not to violate, but to erode the basic rights and freedoms of others by corrupting, whether from the inside or the outside, the institutions that function to establish and maintain them. And it was the latter that was especially concerning for Smith, 
Indeed, throughout the wealth of nations, he issued warnings about certain members of the order of merchants and manufacturers, the business class of his day, who had succumbed to what he called the corporation spirit and used their wealth to exercise undue influence over the political system so as to erode the rights and freedoms of others and thereby give rise to an increase in inequality between themselves and the other orders of society. In fact, they had done so to such an extent that Smith was led to remark, quote, people of the same trade seldom meet together even for merriment or diversion, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. And so he cautioned. I wish that these were passages that people read and repeated more than the Butcher, Baker, and Brewer one, but oh well. So he cautioned, quote, the proposal of any new law or regulation of commerce which comes from this order of merchants and manufacturers ought always to be listened to with great precaution and ought never to be adopted till after having been long and carefully examined, not only with the most scrupulous, but with the most suspicious attention. It comes from an order of men whose interest is never exactly the same with that of the public who have generally an interest to deceive and even to oppress the public, and who accordingly have, upon many occasions, both deceived and oppressed it. Thus, for Smith, the desire of bettering our condition also held the potential for great social harm, in that should it turn against market systems and their institutions, it could give rise to a diminution, not only in liberty, but also in prosperity and equality. Given this, the question would seem to be, how can market systems and their institutions function to ensure that this desire fulfills its potential for great social benefit rather than its potential for great social harm? But this question is more difficult to answer than it may first appear. In fact, it may well present market systems and their institutions with an insoluble problem, which may in turn call the conception of the good they are in the service of into some doubt. But in that event, my work in the area of social economics is of relatively little help for it offers few resources to deal with doubt of this kind. By contrast, Ken's work offers a wealth of resources in this regard. And this difference begins to show how my approach to answering the question, what's an economy good for, would seem to be limited in ways that Ken's is not. Okay, so this section is called The Liberal Good and Its Limits. So as I said earlier, uh, my own work uh, in this area has focused primarily on market economies. And so the question that has lain at its very heart is which conception of the good are market systems in the service of, both in theory and in practice. As such, it's mainly centered around an attempt to define this conception, to explain how the institutions of market systems ought to function, and to outline some of the social benefits that may follow from our working within them, and some of the social harms that may follow from our turning against them. And Smith's thought has been quite useful in this attempt, particularly since his views on the nature and causes of economic inequality accord well with those of at least some contemporary economists, most notably perhaps Joseph Stiglitz and Dean Baker, who have been concerned to diagnose and propose remedies for this increasingly serious social malady. But my work has never really taken up the question of whether this conception of the good is ultimately the one that economic systems in general ought to be in the service of, let alone the question of which conception they in general ought let alone the question of which conception they in general ought to be in the service of, if not autonomy. In part, this has been a strategic decision on my part, but it's also ta tacitly reflected my views that one, even if autonomy is ultimately not the good that economic systems ought to be in the service of, it's also not one that can be summarily dismissed. And that two, even if market systems are ultimately not the best economic systems, functioning ones are better than non-functioning ones. Indeed, if my work could support any practical agenda, it would be one that is mainly reformist in character. By contrast, Ken's work could, I think, support a number of practical agendas, some of which are quite radical. Consider, for example, this passage from that same early article uh, in which he defined social economics. So this is some fiery stuff. The overthrow of classical economics, which Ken endorses here, requires nothing less than the overthrow of the metaphysics of Newtonian mechanics, the epistemology of British empiricism, the Hobbesian philosophy of the human, utilitarian ethics, classical liberal social theory, and the deistic theology of the invisible hand. All this must be replaced by a new metaphysics, a new epistemology, a new philosophical anthropology, a new ethics, a new theory of community, and a new theology. And all these new theories must be well integrated into a comprehensive worldview. Or consider this passage from a more recent piece. What is most called for then is not the mere erection of economic institutions of one form or another, 
Rather, what's required is a radical rethinking of the value foundations for any future economic edifice, and such is an enormous task. But in radically rethinking these value foundations, Ken's work has consistently taken up precisely the question that mine never really has, the question of which conception of the good economic systems in general ought to be in the service of. In this way, it may be seen as a sustained exercise in what Ken calls critical or reflective reasoning, which finds satisfaction not in merely defining the conception of the good that a given economic system is in the service of, or explaining how the institutions of that system ought to function, but only in deliberating over a number of alternative conceptions in order to determine which is best. And I think it's fair to say that in this sustained exercise in critical or reflective reasoning, Ken has determined that the conception of the good that market systems are in the service of ought to give way to an alternative. Or at least, maybe often ought to. I want to attempt to follow Ken's example here, as I have my whole life, apparently, without my knowledge. <laughs> I want to attempt to follow Ken's example here for the next few minutes and engage in a bit of critical or reflective reasoning, and to suggest at least one reason why it could be said that the conception of the good that market systems are in the service of ought to give way to an alternative. In order to do this, I want to return to the question I posed earlier. How can market systems and their institutions function to ensure that the desire of bettering our condition fulfills its potential for great social benefit rather than its potential for great social harm? As I said, this question may well present market systems and their institutions with an insoluble problem. And in fact, it may be an insoluble problem for the system of perfect liberty and its institutions more generally. What's the problem? Put simply, it's that to the extent that liberal institutions generally function to allow, quote, every man to pursue his own interest his own way, and they do so primarily by establishing and maintaining a framework of basic rights and freedoms, they would seem to be incapable of directing our interests in certain ways that may be necessary to prevent us from turning against that very framework. To be sure, they would seem capable enough of preventing us, by and large, from turning against it directly, from violating the basic rights and freedoms of others by, say, subjecting them to illicit force, constraint, or fraud in their exchanges. However, they would seem to be quite incapable of preventing us from turning against it indirectly, from eroding the basic rights and freedoms of others by corrupting, whether from the inside or from the outside, the institutions that function to establish and maintain them. Why? Because if the framework is functioning properly, to violate, to violate the rights and freedoms of others is to risk punishment, which generally does not advance our own interests. Thus, the decision to refrain from doing so requires us neither to care about nor even to consider the interests uh, of any other than our own to consider any interests other than our own. But to erode the rights and freedoms of others may well advance our own interests. Thus, the decision to refrain from doing so requires us both to consider and to care about the general interest in maintaining and perhaps even improving the framework itself. Indeed, it requires us to subordinate our own private interests to, or to identify them with, the general or public good and thus requires us to be possessed of what has often been called public or civic virtue. But liberal institutions would seem to be incapable of directing our interests in this way. They would seem to be incapable of cultivating the civic virtue that they may ultimately require. So it may be because I've been talking a lot about an 18th century thinker and his 1776 magnum opus, uh, it may be because I'm here in the presence of so many Americanists. It may be because I'm in this amazing library with so many books uh, on American history and philosophy uh, that I feel compelled to point out that many influential members of this country's founding generation understood this problem well. It was Benjamin Church, a son of liberty, who had become the chief physician and director general of the medical service of the Continental Army, who wrote in 1773, quote, in every state or society of men, Personal liberty and security must depend upon the collective power of the whole, acting for the general interest. And it was John Adams who pointed out in 1776 that acting for the general interest in turn required, quote, a positive passion for the public good, the public interest, established in the minds of the people, superior to all private passions. Adams called this passion public virtue and declared that it was the only foundation of republics. As Gordon Wood, the preeminent historian of the period, explains, in a republic, each man must somehow be persuaded to submerge his personal wants into the greater good of the whole. This willingness of the individual to sacrifice his private interests for the good of the community 
such patriotism or love of country, the 18th century termed public virtue. And how can such virtue be cultivated? Well, the answer for many influential members of this generation was education. As Wood explains, the most obvious Republican instrument for eliminating these prejudices and inculcating virtue in a people was education. It seemed increasingly clear to many, like Benjamin Rush, that if Americans were not naturally virtuous, they must be taught to be. And here's a quote from Rush. It is possible to convert men into Republican machines. They must be instructed that their lives are not their own. The Republican pupil must, quote, be taught that he does not belong to himself, but that he is public property. John Adams agreed, arguing that if pure, vir per, ugh, arguing that if pure virtue Quote, the only foundation of a free constitution cannot be inspired in our people in a greater measure than they have it now. They may change their rulers and the forms of government, but they will not obtain a lasting liberty. They will only exchange tyrants and tyrannies. Accordingly, Adams incorporated into the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780 a section that read, quote, wisdom and knowledge as well as virtue diffused generally among the body of the people being necessary for the preservation of their rights and liberties. It shall be the duty of legislatures and magistrates in all future periods of this commonwealth to countenance and inculcate the principles of humanity and general benevolence and all social affections and generous sentiments among the people. But an education of the sort that Adams and other, others recommended, a practically formative education in public virtue, would seem to be incompatible with the framework of basic rights and freedoms established and maintained by liberal institutions. And the fact that many members of this country's founding generation prioritized the cultivation of public virtue over these rights and freedoms is revealed by how often they were willing to limit the latter in the service of the former. And this is one of the main paradoxes, I think, of liberal institutions. The framework of rights and freedoms at their center rests uneasy with the cultivation of public virtue that may be necessary to sustain them. For such cultivation would seem to require institutions that are illiberal. This is a paradox whose tensions we seem to be living in today, as basic rights and freedoms are increasingly eroded without a bulwark of public virtue to stem the tide. I'm not sure if this problem is in fact an insoluble one for the system of perfect liberty and its institutions. But if it is, it may call the conception of the good that they're in the service of into some doubt. Indeed, it may be a reason why it could be said that this conception of the good ought to give way to an alternative. But which alternative? As I said earlier, my work offers few resources in this regard, but again, Ken's work offers a wealth of them. And I want to conclude today by highlighting one of the alternative conceptions of the good that Ken has explored. And so this is the last section, and it's uh, called Ken Stickers and Alternatives to the Liberal Good. Ken has explored a number of alternative conceptions of the good over the years, which is why I said I want to conclude today by highlighting only one of them. Among these have been Aristotle's arete, John Dewey's growth, which he defines as, quote, the increasing capacity for future experiences in ever-increasing intensity, richness, order, and complexity and uh, Amartya Sen's and Martha Nussbaum's development of human capabilities. Three conceptions of the good, which incidentally Ken sees as belonging together. But the conception that fascinates me most is the one that he began exploring no fewer than 25 years ago, and has since returned to in his recent work on indigenous economies of gift and thanksgiving. Now Ken does not use the term I'm about, I'm about to use for this conception of the good, but I think it might be an apt one. The term I have in mind is piety, by which I mean being in the right relation to what Ken has called the sacred. I confess that as one who is about as secular as they come, neither of these terms is natural or even comfortable for me. But the ontological propositions about human beings and the world that piety, within the context of Ken's thought, would seem to carry along with it are, even for one such as myself, deeply appealing. As Ken explains, quote, by the sacred, we here mean the organic interconnectedness of all creation and of the bountifulness of being, or as George Bataille following Marcel Mauss describes it, quote, the sense of divine continuity of living beings with the world, which engenders a feeling of the plentitude, the bountifulness of being, of life constantly overflowing itself, excess energy translated into the effervescence of life. Thus, within the context of Ken's thought, piety would seem to carry along with it the ontological propositions, one, that all beings are interconnected, 
and two, that the being of these interconnected beings is one of overabundance. What would piety look like in the light of these propositions? Or, as Ken poses the question, what's the proper response to nature's or her creator's generosity to her abundance? And he suggests, quote, the most obvious response might be to express gratitude and to honor the giver, whether it be called nature, the great spirit, the gods, by in turn acting generously towards them. Sorry, by in turn acting generously towards others, other members of one's community, but also strangers, and not to demand and to acquire more endlessly and selfishly. Thus, piety, being in the right relation to the sacred, would involve not only our expressing gratitude for the overabundant being of the world, but also our becoming overabundant in our own being, and thereby participating fully in what Ken calls the cosmic circulation of spiritual energy which binds together the whole of creation, human and non-human, present and past generations alike. Well said. Ken calls economic systems that are in the service of such a conception of the good economies of gift and thanksgiving. And he points out that their assum assumptions stand, quote, in sharp contrast to modern economics assumptions regarding the unlimited character of human desire to consume and the scarcity of nature. Indeed, consider how out of place Smith's claim that we are all in a nearly constant state of more or less profound dissatisfaction with our situation seems here and how opposed it seems to a claim that Ken cites from a certain Native American elder who said, today is a gift. Who am I to begrudge the fact that I might not have tomorrow? Given the sharpness of these contrasts, one might perhaps be forgiven for asking whether a conception of the good like piety is an alternative to which the one that market systems and their institutions are in the service of could ever plausibly give way. But for Ken, this is rather beside the point. As he explains, the question is not how might we create, how might we, hmm, the question is not how might we recreate economies of gift and thanksgiving, which he suggests probably can't be done, but instead, what can we learn from such economies? What possibilities does the study of them enable us to imagine that orthodox economics tends to preclude a priori? It's precisely because Ken's work has explored so many of these possibilities, so many alternative conceptions of the good, that it offers such a wealth of resources to deal with doubts that might arise with respect to any one of them. Indeed, it's a wealth that is born out of a lifetime of asking the question, what's an economy good for? in the broadest possible way. Questions? Everybody's always slow to this, <laughs> to this point. I know you have questions. Well, it's late July, well, Southern it's Illinois. <laughs> Late afternoon. <laughs> it's shyness. No. Well, Ken has one. Well, I can see. We'll start there. This time. I'm still yeah, working towards yeah. formulation. But I do want to focus on the, the question of, uh, of virtue. Um, and and I, I think maybe you've made, you read uh, Smith uh, closer than I have in this regard. Uh, where What role does virtue play in Smith? Yeah. Um, so... It was after that informal talk uh, at SIU uh, where you said, I think you might have an Adam Smith problem on your hands. You said that to me, and I think that's fair to say. Um, within the, the context of the wealth of nations, and that's the context that I know the best, um, Smith does talk a bit about virtue, um, but the virtues that he describes um, are virtues that he thinks risk being lost primarily by, on the one hand, overwork, so working yourself to death uh, in the pursuit of your betterment, um, and also the, uh, the sort of numbing effects of this kind of work that people are led to do within a very refined division of labor. Um, so those are the two things that he's worried about uh, in terms of the erosion of virtue, and he proposes some measures uh, that a society might take in order to ameliorate those problems, or mitigate them. Um, but in terms of these virtues, the virtues that are necessary for something like democratic citizenship, 
I don't see that uh, in, in Smith. Um, uh, I don't see them mentioned especially. I certainly don't see any proposed solutions for the possibility of their being eroded. Um, so yeah, I, in, in my judgment, uh, the virtues that I'm worried about, I don't know that Smith takes up in any explicit way. Is it a matter of fact that uh, nature or the universe is abundant and self-overflowing? <laughs> Or is it more just a matter of attitude? Do we choose to view nature that way and therefore have an attitude of, attitude of gratitude uh, versus uh, viewing it as scarce and therefore we need to cling on to everything? Yeah. And if it is true that life is self-overflowing, uh, you know, I'm thinking there's more than one way of characterizing that. If you read John Paul Sartre's Nausea, he has explanations <laughs> of nature self-overflowing in a way that's grotesque and superfluous. Right. And everything feels like it's... Uh, why, why does that exist? Why is that necessary? Why does this tree have this knot in it? Yeah. And, and, and that's what nausea is. It's the experience of this superfluous, gratuitous, self-overflowing nature. Yeah. So I just want to care uh, all that. Yeah, so it seems like there's at least two questions. Uh, so one, is this phenomenologically a good description of what the world is like? Maybe even ontologically, is this a good description of what the world is like? And second is, if it is, what's the right response to it, right? We can either respond to it in sort of Nietzschean or Bataillon sense and rebel in it, or maybe we go and throw up, like, like Sartre advised that we do, or couldn't help himself from doing or something. Um, I, yeah, I, I was just saying this to Zach after his talk, um, that my sympathies with anti-essentialism run very deep. Um, and so I, I worry, uh, you know, about you know any kind of very very strong ontological claims about how the world is, um, and I've got lots of reasons for for that. I imagine reasons shared by many in this room. Um, and so I wanted to sort of bracket that uh, and just ask the phenomenological claim: Does it seem to be the case that the world and everything in it ought to be characterized um, by something like overabundance, overflowing productivity, or something like that? Um, I can say that, and who knows how much of this is, is conditioned by the particular frame that I have inherited by using this language and living in this time, but it's very difficult for me to see the world like that. Um, I, I can simply do a sort of personal report. Um, I have no doubt, though, that for people who do embrace this way of knowing and seeing, people who perhaps are um, more at home in these economies of gift and thanksgiving, I have no doubt that they see the world in that way. Um, and if we put aside the sort of stronger ontological question, um, we can just say that, well, that is how the world appears to them, and they seem to be navigating it reasonably well. Um, and so in a way, like I think that's all I can say. I, I, I will tell you that, no, that's not how the world looks to me. <laughs> I see the world as a place of scarcity, and I'm always worried about you know not having enough stuff. So. Yeah. I want to actually build off of that idea of abundance. Abundance is one of my favorite I think, concepts in, in Christian theology, um, for maybe reasons that this work is hinting to. But then I think about what makes people like Freud and Deleuze and Levinas different, right? Is that there is you know instead of this hiding area black whatever there is. There is way too much going on, mm -hmm. right? This is Levinas is you know on escape, right? You too much to handle, gotta put it out somewhere else. And so abundance in, in this way um, can be a blessing, this sort of non secular way, or it can be a huge problem. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder how you might balance the way that we think about abundance uh, and what this has to do with the economy. Yeah, um, I think that for my part, anyway, I think Bataille is probably one of the more useful resources for, for thinking this through. Um, you know, there's a reason why he called the volume that everybody's read, if they've read Bataille, the accursed share, right? You know, the problem is that there is this overabundance, right? There is this excess of being. Um, and then the question becomes, well, what precisely do we do with that excess in the face of it? Um, and his suggestion is that there is a kind of strategy of joyful, meaningful, destruction uh, that must happen uh, in the face of, of this overabundance. Um, I, is, that, is that too sort of you know, nihilistic? I don't know, I don't know what that is, right? Uh, is it the case that we want people running around uh, living out this sort of battalion vision of what the world is and how we ought to respond to it? I, I, I doubt it. Um, but nevertheless, he does point to certain cultural practices that 
uh, again, seem to make it work very, very well. For example, potlatch, uh, that's one of the things that he talks about. Um, now, is it, if we were all to suddenly find ourselves seeing the world in this way, um, what would be the proper response to this overflowing, this overabundance of being? Uh, would we become a culture of potlatch again, uh, where we would have these rituals of destruction, mutual destruction, just to get rid of this excess, this accursed share? Maybe so, but again, it's very, very hard for me to envision myself flourishing under those circumstances. I'm just too provincial, I'm afraid. <laughs> so I want to follow up this line of questioning because it seems to me that on one version of capitalism, it's very amenable to this idea of nature as this inexhaustible resource, mm. right? Talk to a you know, certain oil or whatever, right? Maybe not now, mm -hmm. right? But there was this belief until quite recently that nature was this sort of inexhaustible resource. Yeah. So how does that, so it's not, it's not just changing how we think about nature, because a capitalist could say, oh yeah, I'm going to go get all the oil I can because there's plenty of oil out there. Oh, I love that question. Um, <laughs> yeah, and uh, part of the reason why I love it so much is I just finished reading uh, Shoshana Zuboff's uh, new book, uh, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. I don't know if you're aware of this this book. It, fascinating. Um, yeah. But uh, well, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and the thing is, is so she wants to, to she wants to distinguish the stage of capitalism that we're in right now, which she calls surveillance capitalism, from the capitalism that preceded it. Um, and what's interesting about this particular age of surveillance capitalism is now there is a new overabundant resource in the form of the data that we are unknowingly generating and that's always being harvested, right, uh, usually to service the ends of unknown uh, uh, capitalist actors uh, in the background. Um, and right now, it seems to me that people like Mark Zuckerberg, uh, uh, you know, people like Larry Page, very much are of the opinion that the resource that they care about, the ones that they're interested in, in extracting, is overabundant, that there's, it seems to be this bottomless well, right? Um, yeah, so I, I wonder if that might be in the nature of capitalism itself, uh, insofar as it's extractive, which I think capitalism maybe is in its essence. Um, yeah, maybe this tendency is always going to be there. It also occurs to me that this is uh, very much implicit uh, in Marx's whole theory of exploitation, right? It's, it's not a matter of you know, paying somebody a, a, a low wage where they can't eat enough. That's not the point, right? Exploitation is the idea that I will give you exactly what you need to come back and reproduce your labor tomorrow, and I'm still going to make money because your labor is overabundant, right? It ends up creating more value than it takes to keep it going, right? Um, and so, yeah, I, 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 that's really interesting. It seems to me that probably there is this logic of excess that is at the bottom of or at the center of capitalism, whatever form that it takes, whether we're talking about the exploitation of labor, the exploitation of the environment, or maybe now the exploitation of, of information. Yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> so um, I've, I've been spending a lot of time recently, both with Bataille mm. uh, and with Moss, mm. uh, Marcel Moss. And one of the things, uh, uh, of course, Bataille read Moss. Uh, and they, they were strange, they were strangely different overlaps um, in terms of exactly the questions that you've been asked so far, uh, having to do with excess mm -hmm. and its relationship to capitalism. Um, because neither Moss nor Bataille was friendly to capitalism. Mm -hmm. they, neither one of them uh, uh, were willing to, in, to endorse the way in which excess was was handled. Mm -hmm. In potlatch, of course, there's still a class system. Mm -hmm. In archaic economies, as Moss talks about, um, uh, there's still a class system. And only the wealthy and powerful are actually engaged in what you might call the competitive exchange. Right. Um, and, the, and they didn't care about the rest. Mm -hmm. But it was clear that the system of potlatch depended on excess. Mm -hmm. um, is there something like an informational potlatch going on? <laughs> I, I, do, do you see where I'm going? Mm -hmm. Because because Bataille would say, if you want I think you just made this point and I think you made it brilliantly, which 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 is what we have in excess of our accursed share now is not physical energy as, because uh, Bataille was a vitalist, yep. and he saw all of this as being a physical energy. What we have an excess now of is 
information? No, that's not quite the right word. Mm -hmm. Data might be a better word for it. Zuboff calls it behavioral surplus. <laughs> whatever, whatever yeah. it is. But the question is, is what would a potlatch look like <laughs> uh, under such an excess? Uh, because we live in that situation mm -hmm. where only the privileged, this is actually almost the same question that I asked Zach earlier, uh, because, because the question of the bourgeois deal, put it in the information age mm -hmm. and, and ask yourself what, what is the excess now uh, that, that would constitute the bourgeois the deal in the age of the Renaissance, in the age of the Medicis or something. They're talking about a material excess. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a kind of excess that's it's not exactly virtual and it's definitely not virtue, but there's an information excess that creates Bitcoin yeah. that, cre that creates and, and I mean in, in a way what you what you were just saying was like if you could imagine as Mark Zuckerberg clearly does, if you could imagine that Bitcoin, never mind economic transactions, Look at what happens every time you click your mouse on this or that or the other. There's a, there's a something that is transmitted or created mm. in that clicking, which is much more valuable than, than most people see. And yet, there's a potlatch of it too, which is to say those of us who are so privileged as to click, right, we create an economy, it used to be localized in archaic economies, mm -hmm. um, but what we do is we create a localized economy of clickers, but it's not localized except in the, in the virtual sense. Yeah, right? it's the physics of the thing that is hanging me up here. Uh, oh, because, me too. Yeah, yeah, because uh, you know, uh, when we're talking about material potlatch, it's easy yeah. enough to imagine to something being burned or, or whatever, right? Yeah, um, yeah. But you know, data. We're wasting our time. Yeah, but data are forever. You know, uh, <laughs> they they don't they don't go anywhere. Um, and so the question is, what what would a potlatch of 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 that surplus look like? Um, certainly, it's the case that you know. It seems to me the one avenue that maybe would be interesting to pursue here would be to say that the 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 the, the model of what human beings are like that is implicitly being used by surveillance capitalists and by the firms that, that, that buy their products um, really does assume that we are agents that are incapable of autonomous decision making, that we are just so many members of this herd that can be nudged and pushed and herded and so on in ways that are uh, 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 helpful to the interests of capital. Um, so what is the what, what's the destruction there? I mean, is it the case that something like uh, agency over one's own life uh, is being somehow burned up uh, in in this particular capitalist mode of, of production? I, I I don't know, um, but There's maybe paper there. maybe it's paper there. I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, and it goes to your, your point, you know, that we're just these mindless uh, clickers on screens now, you know, uh, and you know. One wonders, you know, is that is that is that the is that the loss? Do we put pressure on? I mean, what Moss says is that the way that the potlatch works is that the privileged class that can trade in these things that they're going to have to destroy and that are useless anyway, uh, that that the way they place pressure on one another is the necess the necessity of repayment. Right. And the question is whether or not a virtual potlatch makes sense in that. Uh, is there is there sufficient reciprocity in our virtual exchange in order to give rise to a virtual potlatch of not between the, 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 the raw materials that are being mined and the high priests that control the data. Uh, no, there's no, you know, no reciprocity so far as I, or, or very little, so far as I can tell. I think, I, mean, I think you're right so far, but now I want to push you into the future. It's like, yeah. Well, it's, so what's, what's going to happen? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm very skeptical about the... the, the I'm, I'm not, how about this? I'm not terribly hopeful uh, about the prospects for humanity generally, uh, let alone advanced Western society, uh, in technologically advanced Western society. Um, it seems to me that the death knell has been sounding for some time, um, although people have been saying that for a long time too, so why, why is this any different? Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't necessarily see a way out of it. I share the frustrations of the sort of 
you know, the, the classic Marxists, uh, even though I'm not one, you know, would kept asking, when the hell is the revolution coming, right? Uh, you know, and as far as I can tell, it ain't. Uh, and, you know, the, 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 the forces that, that marshal us are just way too powerful at this point. It isn't clear to me that there is much that um, even organized human beings can do. Uh, uh, but, you know, that's me being a pessimist. So. And you being a slightly conspiracy theorist type. Right? I mean, oh, I don't except, know about that. <laughs> except that nobody's driving the bus. Nobody's driving the bus. Okay. That's right. That's right. No, that's right. Yeah, nobody's driving the bus. Yeah. Well, we've been waiting for Ken's response to this paper, so. Uh, oh. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm, I, um, I, I'm going to be speaking uh, a fair amount to it because I, I didn't expect you really to pick up on the uh, the, the Kipti Oh, cool. <laughs> material, so I will expand on that. Uh, but um, I was influenced mainly uh, in this regard by uh, my, my classmate in graduate school, Robert Mungi, who's Lakota Sioux, and uh, as far as I know, the first uh, Native American indigenous PhD in philosophy. <laughs> and so I, I spent a fair amount of time on uh, the Rosebud and Pine Ridge. Uh, Reservations, and and got to see, you know, the the economy give them, and it made me more critical of Mouse and Bataille, because oh. I think what they're describing is a transitional economy uh, to uh, away from the gift uh, to an exchange economy. Yeah, oh, interesting. Uh, okay. what, uh, I saw anyway uh, among the uh, Lakota uh, was a, a pure sense of, of gift without expectation of return. Right. Okay. And that is something whereas, that comes whereas, up. Yeah. Right. What right. Mouse, uh, describes, and then more recently, Grave, uh, Graver uh, you know, describes as how it, uh, it becomes a power play. Right. Uh, right. You, right. You, you overwhelm right. potential enemies with gifts. <laughs> yeah. and say, now you owe me. Yeah. <laughs> and, yep. and, and, and that's a degeneration of what I think can be found in uh, uh, from from what one can see in, you know, within other cultures that have a similar practice. Yeah. Um, but the other thing that you're speaking on, one of the uh, uh, strange things I encountered. You said the you know, comes back to uh, the question of what is the notion uh, of uh, of the human that's uh, at work here. Yeah. And as you might know, you know the British um, outlawed uh, forbid the practice of the patch, uh, potlatch, saying that it was not human for people to be so generous. <laughs> there was this evidence that these were less than yeah. the human beings. But they completely and, misunderstood. It's not generosity. <laughs> it's pressure. <laughs> I mean, Moss at least says. Yeah, that, that's yeah. where I disagree with them. Yeah. I oh, I see. see that. I don't think you see that in uh, in some other cultures. You uh -huh. don't see that kind. Of, that's right. Uh, in you know, because his main examples are the uh, Trobian Islanders and the uh, oh, Pacific yeah. Northwest um, you know, tribes, and uh, mm, um, yeah, they're they're right. It's uh, I think it's uh, devolved <coughs> from what one sees in, in other cultures that practice this. But the the funny thing that I encountered though from my colleague uh, Bob Bungi, uh, was that the uh, Lakota said of the uh, European settlers, uh, they can't be human uh, because, in fact, the word for right. them, and I, I forget what that was, uh, but the word for them, uh, uh, according to Bungi, was meant, looks like a human being, but <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, <laughs> so, not necessarily the real deal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and mm -hmm. because uh, they, and that anybody who was so uh, acquisitive and unable to share could not be fully human. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. No, I mean, it, it, it touches on this idea that, that every ethic springs with it an implicit ontology of the human or, right. or a philosophical anthropology. And it sounds like that was made mm -hmm. in a way, sort of it was, it was brought to the fore uh, uh, in, this, in this collision, right? Uh, yeah, what you're doing right now is not the kind of thing that a genuine human being would do from both sides, right? right. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. 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 Other genuine questions? Paul <laughs> oh, Michael, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>